the customer profile that I want is corporate people. They're spending other people's money, not their own money, in, in big offices, right? But most of the people that are buying that scale already have a vendor. And so I'm trying to take them away from entrenched vendors, whether it's like Halo or whatever. And usually they don't want to switch because the switching cost is high. If they choose me and I fuck it up, then that's their job. Right. right. So All right. <clears throat> I'm having challenges trying how to do you, How do you do that? All right. So the way that you do that, if you're working in the corporate environment, What's worked really well for me, there's a couple of things that, are, that have been phenomenal. Um, number one, yesterday when Rick Roth was talking about um, don't take an order that you can't afford to screw up. I think that was a tremendously valuable piece of advice. I see people going, I want to do work for Nike. I want to you know, go out to do Walmart and this kind of stuff. And it's like, you're not prepared for that. You're in a different situation. So if you want to talk about growth, I started my first company when I was 19. Next week, on July 17th, it will be 47 years, and it's still running as a, as a company. I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was seven years old, right? The way I got into this business is I screen printed the labels for the surfboards that I was making at 14. I got tired of hand drawing them on rice paper, so I started screen printing them. And then, of course, my friend said, well, why don't you, hey, print your logo on my shirt. And boom, I'm in the t-shirt business, right? Funny how that happens. So I've, I've been in this business all the time, and I'm a very analytic person. Most of you who have listened to any of the, my, my podcasts or anything like that, you'll know that I kind of look deeper into these issues. So as a result of that, I tend to th take things apart. And um, early on, I changed my major from engineering to basically printing engineering, which is the science of how you get ink from something onto something else, right? It could be paper, it could be plastic, ceramic, or whatever. And I took all my elective classes in classes I knew I would need, like math and statistics and organic chemistry. I mean, what kind of a person takes organic chemistry as a, an elective? <laughs> and I was driven, right, driven, and it served me well. When I got out and I started doing business, the technique that I used was I looked for images that would be really, really great on shirts, like Coca-Cola, right? And they had these, you've probably seen them from the old Life magazines, there's like a Santa Claus with a Coke tray, iconic images. And this is when it was expensive to do color separations, right? We were like one of the only people in the country that was doing this in 1977, 78. So I separated some of these designs and I submitted them to Coca-Cola knowing full well that they were gonna turn them out, right? And I did it for Country Tide Lemonade and Miller Brewing and you know some pretty big brands. And I got a 5,000 shirt order out of Coca-Cola. White ink on a red shirt, but what the hell? You know, it was, a, it was a step in the door. But the power of it was that I took those images that I did for Coke and that I did for Miller and that I did for Country Time and I would go into my target accounts, which were tiered down. And I said, well, this is what we did for Coke, and this is what we did for Miller, and this is what we did for so-and-so. So it was instant credibility. They connected the dots. I didn't say that I sold it, but I did do it for them, <laughs> right? And there's a, very, there's a very important distinction there. You don't ever want to lie or mislead anybody, and, but that was my marketing approach. And I went from, 200,000 in sales when I graduated from college, because I was working to college, to 4.8 million in 18 months. So that's pretty heavy growth. It was frickin' nuts. You know, and I didn't, I almost put myself out of business because I didn't understand. So that's one way of doing it, is, is to do spec samples for one level above, or comparable to the kind of company that you want to do business with. And in the tech industry, it's really easy because there's so many people at Google and there's so many people at AMD and there's so many people at Advanced Micro Devices and all these different places that if you did a shirt for them, there's no way that they're gonna know in there that, oh, we, we bought it from this vendor. So that's one way of doing it. The other way I do it, and this should be good for you, Mike, is that if you're connected on LinkedIn, you know, I've got about 4,000 connections on LinkedIn. I'm very strategic about who I get connected with. I connect with people that are influencers. I'm looking for people that are connected to other CEOs in certain vertical markets. When I've got a target that I want to go after, I go after the top, right? I go after the CEO, right? And it's the CEO of a company that is 
somebody that I could talk to that could relate. I could never talk to the CEO of Salesforce.com because Benny, Benioff is on a different level. He's a billionaire or you know Oracle or something like that. I'm not in that sphere. But if it's a hundred million dollar company, no problem. You can easily connect with a CEO at a hundred million dollar company. No, no, no sweat whatsoever. So you identify who the target is that you want, and you want to see how many of your connections are also connected to that person, right? Or, you know, that are like a second degree connection away. And then what I do is I go out to those connections and I will say, hey, I need a connection to so-and-so. You know, would you make an introduction to me? I've got this really great program that they'd be interested in. And then I go over here and I talk to a different person and I say, would you introduce me to so-and-so? And over a period of, say, four to six weeks, the CEO of that company will have heard my name three times from three different people. And by the time they connect with me, then it's like, this guy must be something if I'm hearing about him independently from other people. So those two techniques are really powerful for, for getting you in there. You want to go in with a position of authority, and you don't want to be cocky about it, but you want to be, be able to go in and say, I've got something really special to offer. I'm, I do things differently than everybody else. The things that you think that you're doing, I think we can do it better for a number of reasons. If you're in this room and you think that you're in the decorated apparel business, that you're an embroiderer, if you're a t-shirt printer, you're done. There's a freaking million t-shirt printers out there, right? John said it when he said that your t-shirt tells a story. Remember when he said that, right? I own the URL, every t-shirt tells a story. In fact, I'm writing an article right now for Screen Printing Magazine on the t-shirt as media. We live in a time where everything in social media is about expression. And if you tell a story, and especially if you use StoryBrand, right? If you haven't read StoryBrand or connected with it, you know, you can talk to me about it, you can talk to Shelby about it, we're both certified guides. But it's an incredibly powerful tool for clarifying your message and getting people to be able to tell your story. I mean, think about this. Your story or your customer's story is being advocated by the person wearing the shirt. Every person there is, a, is an evangelist for you. And if you use that, you can leverage that brand. It's almost like live printing. It's the same kind of thing. It's experiential. And it, it completely changes the value that you bring to the marketplace. So any other, any other challenges that you're facing? <clears throat> this is interactive here. I'm, I'm here to help what facilitate. Kind of Determining buying the next press, increasing the DTS, like you have money. When do you buy? When do you buy? Okay, so digital, you you want to have a market in place, right? The life of the digital product is nine months to a year. Because the next iteration is going to come out on that cycle. So if you buy a product that's a digital product, particularly DTG, and you don't have a mature market in place, you're going to be dead. You're going to lose money on that deal. So the best way to do it is to contract out as you develop your market and your reputation around it. And once you've got it contracted out and you've got all the bugs worked out, and you know the lingo and you see what the problems are, then at that point, then you can make the purchase. Because as soon as you plug it in, you should have orders waiting for it. When you're growing your business and you're trying to say, when do I add more employees? The rule of thumb that I use is the very minimum, absolute minimum, is $100,000 of sales per employee. So if you're a million dollar company and you have 10 employees, you're skirting the edge. You're, you're probably gonna be break even at that point. And especially with the labor, the way it's going today, right? For my own business, <coughs> I use 400,000 in revenue per employee. And why do I use it so high? It's because I have marketing expense. It's, it's the acquisition cost, it's positioning in the market, it's doing the different kinds of things that I do come out of that extra margin. And I want to be able to pay my employees a very high rate. I don't want them leaving. I want them doing work that they love to do and feeling fulfilled and work, you know, that they're worthwhile and they're important and they're being compensated well for it. So it's part of that culture. From your standpoint, with Profit First, which you'll hear from Mike McCallowitz today, which is great. I feel like I'm the warm up act, you know, the opening act for Mike McCallowitz, um, because I'm such a huge fan of Profit First. And to the point where I went out and I got certified as a profit first professional and then like three months, four months later I got certified as a master uh, profit first. So they, they've certified three different types of 
individuals. They certify accountants, which are like CPAs, bookkeepers, which are the QuickBooks guys that do your work, and consul consultants and coaches. So it's the ABCs. So I'm the consultant and the coach, and now wow. the thing that's really fun is I'm getting to coach on business development the accountants and the bookkeepers. So at the mastery level, I'm doing things to help strengthen that organization. In the meantime, from our standpoint, what it's doing is I'm developing a connected database of really high level CPAs, financial planners, uh, wealth advisors, and bookkeepers to do the work to support your efforts here. Because the bottom line is everybody wants growth. Why do you want growth? We want to get bigger. Well, why do you want to get bigger? Because we'll make more money. Mm, maybe not. But that's the assumption. They think that you're going to get bigger. Well, once you make your money, right, what are you going to do with that money? We're going to buy new stuff. Why are you going to buy new stuff? Well, we need to press. Why? So we can get bigger. Why? So we can make more money, right? It's a circular kind of a thing. So what's going to happen is that when you start hacking growth, is you, you get to a point where there are, there's no need for additional machines or, you know, like Mike is doing now, he's contracting out. He used to be a producer, now he's, now he's a contractor. We don't need to do that. There's a lot of capacity in the marketplace right now. So the idea here is, what does this mean in your life? As your business grows, it becomes an engine, an economic engine, and that engine funds your life, your lifestyle. You know, how much time off, how much travel do you want to have, how much of an investment base do you want to have, what kinds of assets do you want to buy, and those assets then multiply so that you get a higher return and you compound your overall net worth. I never studied this kind of stuff and it was never interesting to me. I was always about the printing. I know it was all about the technology of digital and all that kind of stuff. Well, I had one of those kinds of things where life got in the way of everything else and it threw everything off the track and I lost everything. And it was mistakes that every single person in this room has inherent in their business. I guarantee it because every company I've looked at has the same weaknesses, right? So when I realized that, I did a post-mortem on my own business after I shut production down. And I said, look, I can, either, I can either learn from this or I can be a victim of this and let these events define who I am for the rest of my life. So I found myself at age 58 starting over from zero. And out of that came Catalyst, which is what all this is about. And the reason I call it Catalyst is because it's a series of techniques and methodologies that accelerate your growth. It doesn't change anything about your business, it just makes it a whole lot better and it makes it a whole lot faster and a whole lot more, more efficient. So when you buy new equipment and with Profit First, what I do is I set up what's called a, a sinking fund or a drip account and if I'm going to hire an employee, if I think I need another employee, I'll start putting that person's wage into that account. And if I do that for six months, every, every week during payroll, then I know that I can support that person. And guess what? I've got his wage for six months in a reserve. And I can either use that reserve for training and bringing him up to speed, or I can just leave it sitting there because that's extra profit. Right? You've proved to yourself what that person's going to do. And now you, you've got a much better idea of what the job responsibilities are going to be and what the functions are that that person's going to be. Because now you've got a metric, right, which is that 100000 in revenue. If you're hiring a salesperson, I look at a million. A salesperson is good for a million dollars or more. Right? So if you've got a small shop and you've got three or four people and you're not doing $3 million in, in sales, it means that your sales program is not efficiently configured. And there's ways of doing that as well. And all my people that are locally in, the, in my community, they see me traveling all over the place. I'm not a t-shirt guy anymore. What are you doing traveling so much? I'm seeing clients. What are you doing? I'm helping t-shirt companies become more successful. Well, tell me about it. how do you do that, right? So I change the perception of what people think I'm doing. Right? You can do the same thing. When you do that, you put yourself into a new category. You eliminate your competition and you're able to sell at a higher price. Six to nine margin points higher, which is huge. Yeah. And so getting back to your question about the margins that you have and the cost of goods, it, in the market that you're in right now, that's pretty typical. We gotta move you out of that market. We talked about Blue Ocean yesterday. 
tremendous book. Blue Ocean Strategy, and then there's a new one that just came out like two years ago, Blue, o Blue Ocean something or other. Uh, but they go hand in hand. They're both tremendous because it causes you to look at a market differently. And they, they use examples like Ringling Brothers Circus being redefined by Cirque du Soleil. A $12 circus ticket now is a $140 circus ticket, right? What did Planet Hollywood and um, Hard Rock Cafe and Ring Forest Cafe and all those things, they, they redefined a restaurant into a experience, a customer experience. So when we talk about customer success and customer experience, that's what we want to do. And Printavo is fantastic for that because we're literally in a situation where we can create and define a customer experience. And when we make that a fun experience and we make it experiential where they're participating, that's how you build a loyal customer base and that's how people pay you at a higher level. There's a lot that goes into it, the psychology of where, you know, how we position and all that kind of stuff and I can't do it in a day. I mean, I can't do it in 40 minutes. <laughs> But those kinds of things literally define who you are and define you against everybody else. You're in a league of your own, which is a great place to be. Yes? Um, I'm on the more interested in production side. Do you okay. have any kind of suggestions or anything for like when you're setting your shop up or putting your systems in place? Yes. Like the best way to do that? Well, it kind of. Kind of depends, right. depends on what you're looking for, but you essentially are looking for a workflow. And the two flows that you're looking at are information <coughs> flow and physical product flow. And typically you want things to move in a circular manner, right? They to come in like this, right? So here's your receiving, goods come in, and this is your shipping over here, and your production ha is handling here, the press might be over there, round press or whatever. A production comes down this way, it's packed, and then it ships out. So however the space is that you're looking, you don't want to, you want to avoid any kind of backtracking, any kind of zigzagging, any kind of um, having to go into a different, different area. And you want your support areas to be feeding here. So if the press is right here, your screen room and your ink room should be right there. Right, so it's you have the least amount of distance and the least amount of movement, and everything is happening in parallel as much as possible compared to <coughs> sequentially. Sequentially is slow, parallel is fast because we can do more than one thing at once. We're going to talk about Einstein time, which is making time for ourselves. Right, everybody here that's a common thing that I hear is there's no way I can implement this stuff, I don't have enough time. I'm just like busy, I'm working like 15 hours a day, I can't put any more hours in the day. Well, it's like we have to make time for ourselves and there's definite ways that we can do that. I can make more time than you can even comprehend. In fact, I changed my thinking on time, just like I changed my thinking on how competitive we are, to say this, that when we grow, so when we grow, right, that's our growth, but right behind it is our time, right? So the, the bigger that we get, the more time we put in to handle orders and do the work, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what I did is I changed my view and made a pivot point right here. So if I grow 25%, then I have to decrease my time by 25%. That'll twist your mind, right? That if you grow 100%, you're gonna take your time out of 100% of your time out of your business? That's a phenomenal concept when you think about it. You're growing a business that's gonna run without you in it. Is that not the definition of what we want out of our business, yeah. right? So this causes us to then say, what are we gonna do when we have all this money coming in from this business that we're no longer running, <laughs> right? And that's what we're planning with the financial planners and the tax planners and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like several years ahead of you, you know, getting ready for what the results of this is. Um, so is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. And the best thing to do is if, if you're not a member of SGIA, I would join um, because they have tremendous resources for things like this. M&R has got a plant layout manual that you can get off their website for free to help you lay out plants. They've got different types of setups. There's people in the industry that are really, really good at this. Marshall Atkinson is really good and so is Lon Ages. I work 
work very closely with both of them. I used to do this kind of stuff, but I don't, I don't do it now. Other questions? Yes? Uh, any tips on the best way to motivate and engage employees besides money? Yes. So the key thing here is, is that you, you heard them <coughs> talk yesterday about, um, I think it was Ryan, was talking about doing disk profiles. I use MBTI, which is Myers-Briggs. Okay. And when you take those Myers-Briggs tests, I use 16personalities.com because it's free. And then it's incredibly valuable and it's incredibly insightful for both the employee and it becomes a talking point because essentially what you're doing is where, where bosses get in trouble, where owners get in trouble is they're trying to motivate people to do something that they don't want to do. So we need to find people and understand what motivates them. What is their core why? You know, Simon Sinek uh, is like, why, you know, you know, why great, you know, why people follow great leaders? It's, it's an iconic TED Talk. If you haven't watched it, just Google uh, Simon Sinek uh, TED Talk. And it, there's about 10 different core whys that drive people. My personal core why is to find a better way and share it with others. And I've made a career out of that. Every time I come up with a new idea, I share it with others. Why? Because it's going to make it better for you. Plus, I get the tremendous satisfaction of watching somebody overcome a struggle that they couldn't figure out, right? It's, there's no monetary value there. So when it comes to your employees, it's like figure out what motivates them and then configure your work assignments and your overall culture in the company to include them into purposeful work. Millennials, you know, the other rooms break out. There's probably like five people over there about how to manage millennials. It's like experiential. They've got the one thing, one thing that they really do a lot is experience life. They want to experience things quickly and not defer it into the future. My generation was like work hard, get ahead, you know, take your vacation when you retire. Yeah. That was stupid. I got ripped <laughs> off on that one. <laughs> so the thing about it is, is that by the time you're old enough and have made enough to do that, your body's so tired and you just can't enjoy it. And you can't, you know, I wanted to go climb Machu Picchu. There's not a chance in hell I could do Machu Picchu today. You know, take me six months of training before I could even think about doing that, right? So it's like, we gotta make the choices. And in today's world and the direction that we're going, employee loyalty is a different animal than it was in previous generations. It was like, go to college, get a, get a degree, get a good job, work in that job for 30 years, get your gold watch and retire, right? And that, right? That's the way it was. But now it's like, you don't know when they're gonna downsize, when they're gonna hire, what the economy is doing, we've got no say in any of this. This is a bigger machine than all of us, right? So we have to incorporate that and, and hit the reality of let's make the most that we can while we can. And when things are on the down cycle, let's adjust to that down cycle because it's going to come, right? We just have to accommodate it. Yes? What's the best piece of advice you give to a shop saying going from like 250 to a million? 250 to a million. So that you're in. A very challenging time. So at 350,000 is the first critical milestone in the growth of a company. And that, at that point is generally when they're hiring their first and maybe their second employee. And so you're going from being a, uh, an organization that is primarily self-employed, meaning that if you didn't show up to work today, you're not going to get a paycheck. You're now moving into a situation where somebody else can do work that will benefit you. So. At that point, you need to design your business for the first level of delegation. And that means processes, people, processes, and technology. You get all three of those in alignment, then you can start layering on up until you hit a million. A million is the next milestone. So the big milestones are 350, a million, 3 million, 5 million, and then 10 million. At 10 million, you should pretty much have things uh, together, right? And so the, the catalyst model is de designed to take companies from zero to 10 million in three and a half years. That's a pretty accelerated cycle, but it's totally doable. You know, it just is a matter of if you want to go that fast. And you don't need to go that fast. You need to design the business for yourself. And the advice I would give you is begin with the end in mind. What's your exit strategy for your business? No, don't have one, right? <laughs> I, I, I guarantee that most of you are not, do not have an exit strategy. 
So when you define an exit strategy for your business, every decision that you make is gonna move you towards that exit, right? So it makes your decisions fast, it makes them accurate, and it gives you confidence that you're moving in the right direction because you can say, will this lead me towards my exit sooner rather than later? And there's things along the way, checks and balances that we put in to say, how fast can we grow? Do we have enough capital in place? Is our cash cycle um, robust enough to handle this? You know, when I started looking at the business part of the business in the same way that I looked at technology, which was from a science standpoint and the math standpoint, when I started looking at business that way, I started seeing things completely differently. I saw patterns, you know, like I see patterns and numbers. I'm one of those weird people. And I, I've analyzed now 160, roughly, companies, five years of financial statements, monthly. So, so that's thousands of monthly statements. And I can see patterns within. The beauty of it is, is that when I have that perspective, if you're going from 250 to a million, so instead of driving in the rear view mirror, which is what financial statements are all about, past events that have taken place, you're driving, but you're looking in the rear view mirror. I'm giving you brake lights on the freeway so that you can see what's coming up ahead of time before you get to them. And that's very comforting because it takes that anxiety of growth out of the equation. Got about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Five minutes. Anybody in the back? Anybody else? Yes. Uh, talking about the exit strategies, uh, what, what have you seen from uh, from businesses that want to sell their business? All right. Is it usually, a, you know, five to ten million to make it marketable. <clears throat> yes. Advertising for yes. They and, want to turn key, right? Yes, and that's a great question, and, and it's absolutely where I started with Catalyst, is that I was, I was being approached by baby boomers <coughs> and late Gen Xers, and the conversation always went like this. Oh my God, our kids just told us they don't want the business. We're eight years away from retiring and we don't know what to do, right? And so I sit there and I, I say, let's take a look at your financials. And everybody I look at was like, there's nobody in their right mind that would do this. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is 10 million. So at $10 million, that's the point at which serious investors are going to look at the business because they know that they can put the money in and the business will run without you being in it. So this is about getting your business ready to run without you being in the business. So we're detaching out. And when you do that, it doesn't matter whether you hit 5 million, whether you hit 10 million, you've got an income producing situation that can easily produce a million dollars of net profit a year without you being in it before 10 million, right? So it's when, when business owners get their business configured that way, most of the time they don't want to sell it, but they never could have gotten there on their own, right? So below 10 million, they use a thing called an EBITDA multiplier. So EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, uh, depreciation, and allocations, right? So they add up a bunch of stuff in. It's more than just the net bottom line. The multiple is three to four. So if your EBITDA is 500,000, that business is gonna be worth 1.5 to $2 million, which is not a lot for a year's work, you know, a lifetime of your work. You get the 10 million, that EBITDA multiplier goes up to seven to 15, right? Now you're making more money at 10 million than you were at 5 million or below. And your multiplier is seven to 10 or seven to 15. The 15 is if you have recurring revenue. And a good example of recurring revenue are stores, online stores, right? I think that's time. Uh, okay.